progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance as we open the word of his prophet and we open his word today? Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, we have such great need of you at this time. We thank you for this Sabbath, for the rest from the labors of this week. Help us today. May our minds be open to that which is in your word. May we be guided for this time, prepared for this time, strengthened for this time, so that we may come to understand more of your character and the character that we need to represent. Help us, Father, so that we may set aside and be cleansed from that which we have accepted in this world, and that we may be prepared for your covenant, prepared for the outpouring of your spirit, prepared for the message that is to be given and represented to this world. Guide us in this today, Father. Direct us and direct our steps. For this we thank you. For this we praise you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> The overarching theme of the book of Malachi has been a letter to those that would become the priests and the Levites at the time of this world's history. Now, we've gone over quite a bit of this over the last several weeks. We're going to touch on a few things from the documents before you. And then we're going to go into another document altogether. When the children of Israel left Rephidim, they pursued their journey, winding up a narrow opening through the bold granite rocks of the desert mountains. Why is it important that Mrs. White notes that when the children of Israel left Rephidim, why is Rephidim so important? Um, you're asking, what, what do you mean by that? Important in what sense? Why is it important in their history that Mrs. White and the Bible have noted the children of Israel leaving Rephidim? Well, that was where they didn't have the water. Is that also not where they battled the Amalekites and where Moses raised his hands? As long as his hands were raised, they had victory. Yep. We are now in a situation where we believe that we are battling, but we are not believing that God is in charge. We are having our own, for this time, battle at Rephidim. They gradually ascended higher and higher until there opened before them a wide extended plain enclosed by granite ridges and mountain peaks towering toward heavens. Horeb's range stood before them in somber majesty. Its rocky crags, towering aloft, directed the eyes of the travelers heavenward. Is this not where our eyes are to be directed at all times? Mm -hmm. Heavenward. Awful, silent grandeur reigned over all. What a contrast was the scene to the busy activity of Egypt. 
Here there was nothing to distract the mind, <clears throat> nothing to speak to the senses but the stern granite pinnacles pointing toward heaven. God had commanded Moses to bring his people to this place of natural solitude and sublimity, that they might hear his voice and receive the statute book of heaven. Fifty days previous to this, the pillar of fire had lighted the path through the Red Sea that God had miraculously opened before the marching multitudes of people. Now we have a second point that is being noted that 50 days previous to them coming to this portion before Horeb that God had showed his care for his people. They had since then made their way slowly onward through the desert and God by his miraculous power, had wrought for them in their necessity. When they were parched with thirst, they had murmured against God, forgetful of what he had done for them. But God did not forget them. He gave them water from the flinty rock and rained down bread from heaven to satisfy their hunger. And through the, his providence, taught them lessons of faith in his power. Are we not seeing bread from heaven today in the various things that are being revealed in these studies? Are we, go ahead. I just said most definitely. Okay. Are we not being provided with meat in due season? How many times does God do this on our behalf and we take it for granted? How much like the children of Israel are we today? Now, we're going to skip a few paragraphs and then we're going to go into the next page, next paper. The law of the Ten Commandments, given in awful grandeur from Sinai, can never be repealed while the heavens and the earth remain. All enlightened law and government had its origin in the Ten Words of the Almighty. Those who speak slightingly of the moral code are blinded by sin and are on the side of the great rebel who has ever been at war with the law of God, which is the foundation of his government in heaven and on earth. When God issues a proclamation that men are guiltless, if they cease to love him, to reverence his name and to keep holy his Sabbath, then not till then will the law of God be abrogated. What is she saying here? We are at a point where we're seeing that the law is about to be abrogated. Uh -huh. But when man decides as they have been deciding for over 49 years to set aside the tenets of the law, but yet when they decide to address openly that the Sabbath is not the Sabbath, then and not till then will the law of God be abrogated. God requires of his subjects obedience, not to 90% of the law, but to every one of the 10 precepts. It's all or nothing. 
They are like links of a chain. If one is broken, the chain is of no value. The violation of one commandment makes us commandment breakers. And we must yield willing obedience to all of the precepts of Jehovah. If we would be true to the commandment keepers, for he that offendeth in one part is guilty of all. And I believe we find that in the book of James, second chapter, verse 10. So now if, if James is wrong, then the book of James needs to be removed from the canon of scripture. But if James is right, then keeping the entire law is where we are to be because we need to keep it in our heart, not keeping it outwardly. Those who profess to be ministers of God yet teach the people that God's holy law has no longer any claims upon them are working directly against Christ. They say to the sinner, you are no longer under the terror of Sinai, the bondage of the law. Only come to Jesus and believe in him, and you will be saved. But how can these teachers define sin to their hearers? The Apostle Paul gives us the definition. And here it's, this is interesting for me. Sin is the transgression of the law. And these the, the following are in quotation marks. So we need to be we need to be careful because these would be quoted from the Bible. Sin is the transgression of the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Here we would see Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. But the first sentence, I believe, would be more clearly 1 John 3, verse 4. Now, what we're going to be dealing with today is a brief study using Miller's rules. Now, Father Miller was very clear with, with all of us that choose to study the Bible. What does Ellen White say about those that would truly understand and give the warning message of Revelation 14. Does she not say that those that would give this message would be studying their Bibles in the same manner as did Father Miller? Mm -hmm. and they would have the character of christ okay now one of the points that has come up multiple times in the last few studies has been the definition that there were three days now we note that there were three days when we're dealing with the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. We dealt with three days that were symbolic in the Millerite time. We dealt with three days where the walls and the streets were being inspected by Nehemiah. Right? Mm -hmm. But yet, have we defined three days? Have we defined what Father Miller would have seen? 
So what is before you now is a document, taking it from Cruden's concordance to follow one of Miller's rules. Where you wish to understand a subject, bring all of the verses together. Not some, not many, mm -hmm. but all, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> that's where your um, that's where your concordance comes in. Very much. <clears throat> but as I've been finding, it's it's real interesting to bring the concordance in, especially as I have been finding that there are different more abridged versions of the Cruden's Concordance. We had quite a conversation that was going on last night regarding different references within King James Bibles. And as, as you're well aware, I do make use of a 1769 King James Bible. Mostly because this is the same type of Bible that I believe Father Miller would have been using and would have been used with the early Adventist pioneers up through 1844. Mm -hmm. Now we need to go through this portion of this paper because we really need to have a conversation about what the Bible is showing about three days and whether this is something that is important for us to come to understand. As Cruden wrote, the day is distinguished into natural, civil, and artificial. The natural or solar day is the duration of four and 20 hours. The artificial day is the time of the sun's continuance above the horizon which is unequal according to different times and seasons by reason of the obliquity of the sphere. God called the light day, that is the artificial day. The evening and the morning were the first day, namely the natural, Genesis 1.5. The civil day is that the beginning and the end whereof is determined by the common custom of any nation. The Hebrews began their civil and ecclesiastical day from one evening to another. From even unto even shall, you cel shall ye celebrate your Sabbath, Leviticus 23, 32. The Babylonians reckon their days from one sun rising to another, the Italians from one sunset to another, from some from noon to noon, and others from midnight to midnight. Now, I'm not sure that he's correct about the Babylonian day starting at sunrise. Okay. So I've never run into that. Okay. So it's just uh, an odd thing. It's a good point. I mean, this this is just a direct copy of, of what Cruden had written. So, yeah, yeah, but I, I just don't know if that's correct. That's all I'm saying. It's for me, it's interesting because when I was in grade school, my family was just then beginning to attend an Adventist church, and I had a teacher that wanted me set back because he he viewed me as mentally deficient because mm -hmm. as we were going through studies i was reading from the bible and understanding that the day the evening and the morning were the day that the evening at sunset was the beginning of the new day uh -huh. the teacher that I had for some classes at that time believed that the day began at midnight or at one o'clock in the morning. And he was very vocal that anyone that believed differently from him was not right in the head. <laughs> I know that guy. Okay. 
So in a, in a parent teacher conference, he was very animated going through this with my parents because I was holding to evening and morning being the day with the day beginning at evening. And he just believed I had no place in that school. Wow. Wow. Why did he hold such a weird view? He believed that he was more properly educated than, than many others. Right. Yeah. Do I don't think he was properly educated. <laughs> well, it's what I ran into. And I, it's just one of those things that has, has stuck with me for many years. Yeah. Anyway, I can't find anything that says that the Babylonian day is other than from sunset to sunset. Okay. Uh, that seems to be what everyone says. I found something where it says it started one hour after sunrise. It's babylonianhours.com, but I mean, I'm just skimming down it, right? Mm. But that's what I read. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I can't find that in anything um, of the ancient writings. Okay. Yeah, I found what you're looking at. Um, I don't think that's correct. Ooh, Angela? Yeah. I mean, you have the daytime but that wouldn't be the actual day. Anyway, go on, Dwight. Okay. This day or today do not only signify the particular day on which one is speaking, but likewise any indefinite time. Thou art to pass over Jordan this day, Deuteronomy 9.1. That is, in a short time after this, the word day being often put for time, as in Genesis 2, 4, and 17. In the day when God made the earth and the heavens, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That is, at the time when thou eatest, eatest thereof. Now, here again, this was a warning to our parents in the day when God made the earth and the heavens, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Today, if you will hear his voice, Hebrews 3.15, that is, in this present season of grace, while you enjoy the means of grace, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Romans 13, 12. The time of heathenish ignorance and profaneness is in a great measure over, and the time of gospel light and saving knowledge is begun among us. The day of Jerusalem is the time of its calamity and destruction, Psalm 137, 7. Abraham desired, desired to see my day, says our Savior, John 856. He desired to have a prospect of the time of my coming in the flesh. One man esteemeth one day above the other. Romans 14.5. He thinks that the Jewish festivals are holier than other days and still to be observed. He seeth that his day is coming. Psalms 37.13. The time appointed by God for his punishment or destruction. Are we yet to keep the Jewish festivals? Well, no. Right. Because we have seen that type has met anti-type. So their day is past, but their example is here for us. This day have I begotten thee, Psalm 2.7. That is, from all eternity, in which there is no succession, no yesterday, no tomorrow, 
but it is all as one continued day or moment without change or flux. Or this day may refer to the manifestation of Christ's eternal sonship in time, either in his birth and life, when his being the son of God was demonstrated by the testimony of the angel, Luke 132, and of God the Father, Matthew 3.17 and 17.5. But chiefly at his resurrection, by which he was declared to be the son of God with power, Romans 1.4. In one day, that is suddenly and unexpectedly, Revelation 18.8. The Christian Sabbath is called the Lord's Day. Revelation 1.10. As the sacrament is called the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11.20. Because Christ instituted it, or because the end of its institution was the remembrance of Christ's resurrection, as the end of the Lord's Supper was the commemoration of his death, or because it was employed in his worship and service. The day of judgment is likely called the Lord's Day, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. Now here we would have a bit of a disagreement with Cruden, because there is no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. There is a Sabbath for man, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So... In this situation, it's interesting because there are so many points that Cruden understood so very well because he, of course, had read of the book of James and he had read what Paul had had to say, yet he still held on to a belief that there were two different Sabbaths. It is by his destruction, because thereon he is appointed to judge the world, but the Sabbath is his by consecration, by choice, and by institution. On that, we are speaking solely of God, and it's his great gift to man. Now we're going to go into some points on three days. In assembling all of the verses that have anything to do with three days, we begin in the book of Genesis. What story do we have here? And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. Where is Joseph at this time? Well, he's in prison. Right. And in the vine, there were three branches. And it was as though it budded and her blossom shut forth and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand and the former manner when thou wast his butler. So we have three branches that are being equated with three days. Now it's only because that God gave Joseph the understanding that Joseph was able to make this proclamation, right? Mm -hmm. It is only because we are allowed his word and we are able to examine his word that we will come to an understanding because we are assembling all of the verses on this subject together. Now, as the story continued, five verses later, and Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. 
the three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Two men, one with three vines, one with three baskets. Three vines are three days, three baskets are three days. Is there anything that is unimportant about these two symbols? No. Okay. Now, as we continue, Genesis 42. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother. And ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together in toward three days. And Joseph said unto them on the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. Why did Joseph hold his brothers in prison for three days? What was he doing here? Possibly um, their reward for selling him into Egypt. Any other thoughts? I think it was a test for them. Like while they were there, all they could do was think and muse over what they'd done and hopefully be remorseful for it which is what happened. Anything else? He was maybe under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Agreed. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What did he say? He believed that uh, Joseph was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, Yes. What if this three-day period was a test of their character? I was wondering that. Yeah, well, I mean, he's putting them in a situation where they're going to either start blaming each other or, um, you know, he, their characters are going to be manifest in some way. Yeah, and he hadn't now seen them for how another. many years? 22. Yeah, he probably didn't know what became of their kids. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, whether they accept the judgment or not, uh, just kind of puts it in the same respect as um, they've got the uh, three, three days or three. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing train of thought. Not the three one common. What were they like before? What were they like at the time that they sold Joseph into slavery? Mean and vindictive. How about contentious? That works too, yeah. That could be a word, yes. Okay, so here's here's the situation. Joseph knew that there was a a, a series of disagreements within the brothers. Judah wanted to be able to get Joseph out of the pit, right? Mm -hmm. Which was the right. brother? What, uh, what wasn't Judah that? Uh, Isn't it Benjamin? Um, Benjamin no. wasn't there. No, no, no. Right. It's not Benjamin. But was, uh, uh, was it the oldest? I thought it was Reuben. But yeah, I think it, it was ben Reuben. Okay. Judah's the one that sold him to the Ishmaelites. Who, who is the one that pressed the hardest to sell him to the Ishmaelites? Judah. I believe it's Simeon. Simeon? Okay. Yeah. Because Simeon is the one that's kept in prison. 
Okay. Reuben, of course, was the one that that sinned by having sexual relations with his stepmother. He defiled Jacob's bed. Simeon was the one that sought to sell Joseph. But there was there was a, a, a large kind of attitude amongst the brothers. They were not united in anything. So as I read through this, as I'm looking at this, I, I had to wonder if this was not a test of their character. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Whether they had changed or not. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> okay. It's feasible. Okay. It says here in spirit of prophecy, um, just, just going back to Judah and it says soon a company of travelers was seen approaching. It was a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt with merchandise. Judah now proposed to sell their brother okay. instead of leaving him to die while he would be effectually put out of their way. Um, so, so that's what Alan White says. Okay. So you're correct on that. Yeah. I stand, and it, I stand corrected. Yeah, it's it's Judah. And that's why the joining of the two sticks, you got one stick for Judah and one for Joseph. Because this is the separation of the two sticks, and, and Judah and Joseph are the ones mentioned. And, and yeah, it says this in the Bible as well, that Judah is the one. Uh, who does this? Mm -hmm. Judah says unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content and there they passed by many night merchantmen and they drew, lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. I think it was Simeon who was the one who wanted Joseph to die in the pit, but I, I would have to look in that a bit more detail. Anyway, sorry about that. I just no, no, wanted... no, 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 no. This is the whole point of of this study, is to have conversation. Okay. So don't be sorry about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, if we go to Exodus three eighteen. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. <clears throat> and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So the command is given for the Hebrews to go three days journey into the wilderness. Now this is followed again into Exodus 5 and Exodus 8. And they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and they will not stone us? We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. So here again, we have three days. 
here again, we are being told that the, the, the children of Israel are to go outside of the sight of the Egyptians to sacrifice to God. Can we draw anything from this when we're comparing these three days that are commanded with the three days inspection that Nehemiah did on the streets and the walls where they refused the help of the other nations around them? Is there anything similar about these two examples? Okay. Um, so you're saying in Nehemiah, they, um, what did you say about what happens in Nehemiah? Well, you have the three days. Yeah. In, in Nehemiah, but Nehemiah had been approached by the leaders of the other nations to let them assist in rebuilding the walls and the streets, right? Um, well, that I'm not certain of. Okay. Or is it that they were approached to help in the rebuilding of the temple? Yeah, they were approached in the rebuilding of the temple in, in the time of Cyrus. Okay. In the time of Nehemiah, the enemies were trying to stop them from building the walls. And that's why they had to have their swords on their side. I don't see anything about them asking. So basically, Nehemiah, he gets there because um, he leaves in the month of Nisan and he gets to Jerusalem with this letter from Artax um, Artaxerxes. And then he comes and he inspects the building. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Um, I rose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. Um, there I did. Okay. They're singing some songs there. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see anything that uh, they just oppose them in Nehemiah chapter two. So would the, would the Egyptians have opposed the children of Israel in performing sacrifices of the animals of that God would have ordained. Mm -hmm. Why? Why would they oppose it? Yeah. Well, because they worship these animals. In other words, the children of Israel would have been sacrificing the gods of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So this is being stated that we wish to sacrifice as God has ordained, but your people will see this as sacrificing your gods. Mm -hmm. So now we need to be out of your sight in order for us to be able to worship our God. Mm -hmm. so is the three days important in this example yeah the three days is important 
I'm not sure I understand exactly the comparison between the two. Okay, well, let's continue. Exodus 10. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. The darkness was one of the plagues, right? Mm -hmm. And it's three days. And the Egyptians had no light, but there were light in the dwellings of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Exodus 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So this example, Exodus 15, is after the crossing of the Red Sea. They go three days into the wilderness. They find no water. Mm -hmm. Yet they're soon to be given water from the flinty rock, as we read earlier. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, Joshua 1, verse 11. Pass through the host, command the people, saying, prepare you victuals. For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan, go in to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Now, when the children of Israel left Egypt, had they prepared food for their journey? No. So here, before going into the promised land, Joshua is telling them to prepare food. When they left, they prepared no food. Mm -hmm. When they are coming in the promised land, they are told to prepare food. But this is also being shown that within three days, they are to pass over the Jordan. Joshua 2. And she said unto them, get you into the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourself there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward ye may go your way. And when they went and came unto the mountain and abode there three days, until the pursuers were returned, and the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. What example do we take from this? We have men there being told to hide themselves for three days. Mm -hmm. There are those that were pursuing them and they sought them for those three days, but they couldn't find them. In the book of Judges, we find, and his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink and lodged there. Continuing to 1 Samuel chapter 9. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place. For ye shall eat with me today and tomorrow. I will let thee go and 
will tell thee all that is in thy heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? So here we have the meeting of Samuel with Saul before Saul is announced as king of all Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Yet we have three days. Three days where these asses, three days where Islam, Islam yeah. had been lost. Now they are found. What can we draw from this? Well, there's lots of things you could draw okay. from. Right. <laughs> this is also <clears throat> as a study. It's also for us to consider because there are many symbols that are being presented. And of these symbols, we're going to find many of them that are gonna be relevant for us today. Now we go to 1 Samuel 21. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanct sanctified this day in a vessel. So David is seeking what kind of bread? Is it not the showbread? Yeah, the showbread. Yeah. He's seeking that bread not just for himself, but also for his men, right? Yeah. But how long was the showbread to remain on the table? Hmm. Wasn't it one week? Was it? Was it one week? I don't know. I thought it was to be, to be changed or replaced each day, like day and day and evening. Am I wrong? <laughs> Where can we find this in scripture? What do we find? I'm trying to find it. Okay. Well, I think it's I think it's daily. All right. Uh, just because Exodus twenty five thirty and says, "Thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me alway," in the King James, but that word "alway" is tamid, which means daily or continually. But just looking up showbread, I can't see any reference that would help us what's uh, what does it say in leviticus 24 5 to 9 okay when i type up showbread it doesn't even give me that leviticus leviticus 24, 24 5 through 9 thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof two tenths deal shall they be one cake and 
Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord, continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So there it says weekly. If we're going to take that it's placed there every Sabbath. Okay, so would David, I mean, this, this situation, and the priest answered David and said, there's no common bread under my hand, but that which is hallowed. Great. Does that mean then that this is the bread that is being replaced after the Sabbath? I don't know. Well, it's either that it's being replaced after Sabbath or it's being replaced just before the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Okay. First Samuel 30. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days agone I fell sick. What are we looking at in this in this example? We have an Egyptian and an Amalekite. Uh -huh. He is a servant to an Amalekite. Now, if David or Saul or those of Israel had found an Amalekite, what were they to do? Well, kill him. Right. So here again, we have three days where this man had not had any water. He had eaten no bread, mm -hmm. three days, three nights. Second Samuel 20, verses 3 and 4. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took ten women his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them inward and fed them and went not into them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. Then said the king to Amasa, assemble me the men of Judah within three days, and be thou here present. So the men of Judah are being assembled within three days. In Ezra 10, we're not the men of Judah also assembled. Yeah. This, this was Judah and Benjamin, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Second Samuel 24, 13. And we're going to be comparing this with first Chronicles. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see whether I shall return to him that sent me. Comparing this with First Chronicles 21. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, choose thee, either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thy enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself 
what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. What's important about these examples? We have three days pestilence. Three days destruction of the harvest, of the grain, of the bread. And because of this pestilence, 70,000 fell. First Kings 12.5. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. Is this not part of the story of Rehoboam? Yep, that is. Okay. Second Chronicles 10, 5. And he said unto them, come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. Is this not a repeat mm -hmm. of what we find in First Kings? Yeah. Would this have any kind of comparison with what we have determined to be the second angel's message, is this not a repeat? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going back uh, to uh, yes. where it talks about the showbread. Yes. Being Please. placed on every Sabbath. It's interesting that it, um, it says literally, uh, in the day the Sabbath, in the day the Sabbath. It actually, instead of saying every Sabbath, um, that's what it says literally in Hebrew. It doubles it. So is this with the showbread another example of the second angel's message? Mm -hmm. What else can we determine from that? Mm. Who is to eat the showbread? Well, the priests. Okay. The priests were to eat the showbread. You've just established the day, the Sabbath, the day, the Sabbath. So we have a, a repeating, which is again, giving us the identification for the second angel's message. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with this being something for our time because of our study of the book of Nehemiah, or of, of Nehemiah, but also with um, uh, bear with me for a second. Ezra. Malachi. Oh, Malachi. Okay. So we have Ezra, we have Malachi, identifying where we are to be in this earth's history. So what bread is it that is the show bread? Is it not the 2520? Well, it would have to be more than that, though. Okay, then what else? How would we say it is going to be more than that? Is it, is it the returning to the covenant? Hmm. 
Well, you would think it would have something to do with the oath being the seven times. Right. But if we're accepting of the oath, if we're accepting of the seven times, are we not accepting the covenant that God laid before all Israel and later laid just before the sons of Levi? Could you repeat that one more time? Okay. If we are accepting that this is part of the oath, part of the seven times, or as we were establishing in, in some of the studies this last week, coming to the well of Bir Sheba, the well of the oath. Is this also not accepting of the covenant that was made first with all of Israel and later presented just before the sons of Levi? As we're finding from the book of Malachi and as we're finding in Leviticus. Okay, well... So the way that I see it is this three days is a symbol of the prediction before midnight. All right. And now we have the, the show bread um, that you're now connect, connecting this with through the story of David and the three days that they, they're not with a woman which represents a church. Um, and of course, the three days separation uh, to separate, to call to repent, to separate from the strange wives. Right. Um, but this is about the second angel's message because the prediction before midnight, the three days from July 18th to July 21st in 1844, that's a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Agreed. And, and, and I've argued that the three days in Ezra is the period of time from July 18th to December 25th. Um, I mean, I understand a little bit dealing with the 2520 that it's connected because it is connected to uh, the second angel's message. I'm not fully seeing where you're going with this, I guess. The whole, the whole point right now is as we're assembling all of the verses that have to do with three days. Yeah. If we make a conclusion based upon this, we cannot be in error. Is well, that we could not, be in error if we're, we're not obeying God. <laughs> right. Okay. But if we are obeying God, and we yeah. are assembling all of these verses and we are comparing them and we come to a conclusion and we examine the conclusion. Yeah, well, the conclusion is, I mean, these three days are a symbol that represents, it's also represented to the three days that Jesus is in the grave. Right. Um, it has to do with the covenant because he's going to do that in confirming the covenant. So the covenant is connected to these prophetic periods. Right. Um, so we need to accept the prophecies um, of scripture. That's, that's all I have. Okay. Okay, 2 Kings 2.17. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men, and they sought three days, 
but found him not. So here again, we have 50 and we have three. Yeah. This is in, in the example that is given us after Elijah is taken unto heaven. Right? Mm -hmm. 50 being an example of the year of release. But just like we saw in Nehemiah, we have three days inspection, and here they are seeking three days. Is that not a type of inspection? Mm -hmm. So we have, go ahead. I know Stephen did a study on this before. I can't remember what he did. Okay. Dealing with these 50 men in the three days. Going to have to ask him about it. I can't find it in, in my emails. Okay. Second Chronicles 20, 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and the precious jewels. And when they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away, and they were three days in gathering the spoil, it was so much. Now we go to Ezra 8.15. And I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava. And there we abode in tents three days. And I viewed the people and the priests and found there none of the sons of Levi. Ezra 10. For me, the crux of this whole matter. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Yohanan, the son of Elisha. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance would be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. This application was being made to December 25th of the year that is now passed. We have the men of Judah and Benjamin that gather themselves together in Jerusalem within those three days. They have been told to separate from their strange wives. They are before the house of God and they are in the great reign. Esther 4.16, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Sushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. So I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Here we've made application that this is an example of the Sunday law. 
here Esther is asking for prayer and supplication for three days and three nights. And she is asking that they fast in those three days and those three nights. Jonah 117 compared with Matthew 1240. Now the Lord has prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. As the Savior stated, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If, if we are among those that are to give this message, and are to represent the character of Christ, will we not have an experience similar to that of Christ? Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Christ was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth or the grave. We have observed that there are three days of inspection, there are three days where the children of Israel were told, come not at your wives, clean your clothes. We have these three days as part of a total of 52 days and at least two examples. So all of this has importance for us today. All of these symbols are things we need to be paying attention to. What else can we take from this? Well, we know the three days is a symbol that Christ uses and that that symbol is connected to Jonah. It's connected to all these other histories. And it's the sign, right? The sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay. A foolish and adulterous generation look at, after a sign or looketh for a sign. Now, the question is, um, why are we just given this symbol, this sign of Jonah, this three days? What does that mean that we're given only that and not any other sign? Because it was... Because if we're only given it, it must be connected to everything that we're given, not just some things. Right. Here we have three days. In Revelation 14, we have three angels' message. Mm hmm Are the messages also days? Mm -hmm. and, and when we look at um, even our line, the 777 uh, line. So one thing we know is there's three dates that are all Sabbaths okay. that are connected to, to the basic structure. I mean, you could also put March 27th in there as well. But the three dates are November, November 9th. July 18th and um, December 25th, so 19, 20, and 21, respectively. Now, we take this, these as symbols, 
Now, you, you could even say the three days are the three dates, July 18th, March 27th, and December 25th. And that's the period of time after July 18th. But they do in some ways symbolize the first, second, and third angel's message. It's a repeat of history. Um, so God's given us this symbol. The particular question would be why? What does it mean um, as far as entering into a covenant with God? Like what does it mean in, in a sort of a practical sense to us right so, now? Question here. I mean, as I'm reading on these things, they, each and every, not each and every one of them, but they all seem some like some sort of a, a process. Uh, again, the three angels message is a process. Um, these three days, each of those, not each of them, but a lot of them are, are has something to do with some form of a process, getting yourself ready for something. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm seeing? I mean, that's that's what I'm yeah. seeing. All right, yeah. I'm. I would say that's correct. Mm -hmm. So, is there anything completely common to all of these other than the three days? Because it doesn't seem like there's, you know, a a, a single thread running through them, but the three days. Well, there is a prophetic symbol there so that it's connected to prophecy. Yes. So the idea of three days. Yes. Um, it's, it's a unit of time. It's, it's um, a time of preparation. So we believe that there's a call to this movement that's characterized by the three day call in the story of, of um, Ezra. But there's three periods of three days. There's the three days at the river Ahava. There's the three days after they arrive at Jerusalem before they deliver the gold and silver to the temple. And there's the three days call to repentance. And these, these, the fact that there's three and that they give us this prophetic structure uh, pointing to uh, Pentecost and the Day of Atonement in 457 BC by looking at the chiasm that these three days offer us and the dates connected with it. And it parallels Millerite history. And we're repeating Millerite history, but we're also repeating the history of Ezra, as well as all the history of the decrees. Agree. So the question I have, though, is the practical sense, what does it mean for us as a tool to understand prophecy who we are, when we are, and what it is we should be doing, rather than what I see people doing. Um, because from my perspective, just in, to talk really plainly, is I see a bunch of fanaticism in this movement right now that is ignoring, ignoring these prophetic symbols. That is, it's picking up on some symbols. And we saw the same thing in early writings, page 74, where you have these people who have accepted October 22nd, 1844, and yet, at least in word, but yet are not doing the work that God had given them to do. Instead, they're going to old Jerusalem or they're setting dates um, and they're ignoring uh, the messages from the spirit of prophecy. And, and we're in that same boat today. We're in early yeah. months, page 74. Yeah, it seems that way, yes. No, I'm sorry. Um, before I forget, Dwight? Yes. Uh, did you ever mail out that uh, Excel sheet that you did a presentation on last week? Didn't I send the, that to you, Theodore? The one with the... Uh, the mirror that I got excited about. <laughs> right. Um, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it come out. Um, it might be buried in something, but uh, I haven't, I, tr I opened up everything and I didn't see an extra attachment on anything. I wonder if it'd be in spam or something. Okay, well, yeah, the Excel spreadsheet. Well, I'll send it out again. Uh, I'll just send it out. Mail or anything. 
send, send me that too. Send me that one too. If you yeah, yeah, I'll send it to everyone. I'll put it in a new email and then okay. just so, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I didn't mean to distract you, but oh, no, uh, you're fine. that's okay. Okay, so Dwight, how do you respond to what I said there? Well, the the whole point right now is there is fanaticism. We are not united. No, we're not. We are coming to a period very much like the disciples had when Christ returned to heaven. Because for nine days, they were in the upper room. Mm -hmm. Three sets of threes. Three sets of threes, exactly. Mm. Yeah, I'm feeling you. Okay. Now, in that time frame, they were praying, they were confessing sins, they were examining their own souls. On the 10th day, we wind up with the Feast of Weeks, which has become known as Pentecost. Right. Right. So... They completed their 49 days. And then they were prepared to enter into covenant with God, right? Right. That's supposed to be. Okay. But we see the same situation as, as you were just saying in the mirror. Because mm -hmm. when we're looking at this situation from 1798 to 1800, we have three years, which we can apply to our situation of 2019, 2020, 2021, right? Yeah, it's not a stretch. Okay. Now, 49 years after the next Pope was selected, we have a group that has come through the disappointments of the Millerites and they are now accepting the Sabbath. Mm. The following year in 1850, we have the 1850 chart outlining the Sabbath, outlining everything that the Millerites had studied. But at that point, God was preparing his people so they could enter into a covenant with him. That was in 1850, right? That was 1850, right. So, but they failed that at some point. Right. And, and we, we end up with 1863. Exactly. And yeah. of course. And, and 1850 is, is early writing 74. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. let's, let's also remember. From 1850 to 1863 is a span of how long? Uh, 13 years? <laughs> 13 years. 13 years, yes. And 13 years is a symbol of what? Is it not a symbol of rebellion? Mm -hmm. Yes. So all of this is working in accordance with the symbols that God has laid out before us already. Mm. So here we have these symbols of these three days. Mm -hmm. Now, as we, as we continue through this, Matthew 15, 32 and Mark 8, 2, both examples of the same occurrence. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion upon the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. In Mark, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. So this is the feeding of the 4,000, not the 5,000. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Matthew 26, 61, the testimony given against Christ, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Mm. Matthew 27, 40, Mark 14, 15, and John 2. And saying, thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. What kind of words were these? Mark 14. And we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. John 2.19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Here he was not speaking literal. He was being very figurative but he was mm. speaking of his body. Yeah. As we you have been, see, go ahead. You can start seeing the transition from literal to spiritual uh, right. in much of Jesus' work. Matthew 27, 63. Saying, sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Luke 2.46, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. A 12-year-old in the temple, in front right. of the learned Ben, asking them questions. <clears throat> Now we come to the, the story of Saul, who became Paul. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Mm. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Ananias was afraid to go on to Saul. Saul was blind. Have we not been spiritually blind, blinded by many of the things within the church? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, how like Saul are we today? Uh, same character. There you go. Mm -hmm. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Acts 28, 7. Revelation 11, 9 through 11. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. 
And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Now we've, we've been applying this, of course, to the French Revolution. Is there an application for our time? It would almost have to be. I mean, it would have to be. Of the verses that have to do with three days, we have now gone through all of the verses of three days that we can find in Scripture. Yeah, well, we didn't address the third day. Okay. Even though three days is related to it, because... Often when they're talking about three days here, they're meaning the third day. Right. Right. Today, tomorrow, and the third day. Okay. Right. So so we, we could look at those as well. Right. Yes, I agree. Okay. But there were some other items that in preparing this paper that I took a look at. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go on to those for now. We may have to return to the third day. And I'm not I'm not setting it aside at all because mm -hmm. your point is correct. Now, here are references to 40 days. We know of the 40 days in the time of the flood. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. So it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis 50, Genesis 50 verse 3. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days, 70 days. So is this telling us that it took 40 days for the Egyptians to embalm bodies? Exodus 24, 18 and 34, 28. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then 10 chapters later, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So Moses went up into the mount twice for periods of 40 days. Mm -hmm. Is this not another type of a doubling? In reference to the 40 days and the 40 nights. Right. Yes, I'd agree. So we have Moses going up for 40 days and 40 nights. He receives the first tables. He breaks the first tables. And then he has to come back. And he writes upon the tables on the tables of stone that Moses was told to prepare. Yeah. 
is this not a good example of our time today where first the covenant is entered into and then the children of Israel set it aside much as the church originally received the covenant, the two tables, the 1843 and the 1850 chart, and then chose to set those aside to become more like the world, to take the understanding of men rather than the understanding of God. Numbers 13, 25. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Numbers 14, 33 and 34. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And after the number of the days which ye searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Yet, what does that really mean? My, the breach, my breach of promise? Numbers 1434. What's that really saying to us? Breaking the covenant. Okay. Numbers 14.34. And ye shall know the altering of my purpose. Is the alternate reading. So if we read this again, after the number of days in which ye searched the land, even 40 days, every day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know the altering of my purpose. So, so God's purpose was to bring them into the promised land immediately, but they're going to have to be in the wilderness for 40 years. Right. So it was the choice of the children of Israel not to follow God's purpose for them. They chose to follow after their own hearts rather than following God. <laughs> what does that say to us today? What does that show us today? Men's hearts are to do, to do evil continually. Yes, exactly. Now, Moses was pretty blunt in Deuteronomy. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Deuteronomy 9.9 when I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. He repeats in Deuteronomy 10.10. 10, and I stayed in the mount according to the first time forty days and forty nights. And the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. Numerically, 
is it now interesting that we have a doubling in the first verse and a doubling in the second? Mm -hmm. With the same I message see it. given. So I find it intriguing. Yeah, well, you know, it helps to have somebody point things out. I mean, <laughs> uh, I can look at a picture all day long and then somebody comes up, stands beside me at the last part of the showing and goes, did you notice that? And you're like, oh, no, I didn't see that. And that makes even more sense now. <laughs> I, ha I have indeed had that same experience. <laughs> We come, we become blinded at times. Um, you know, we're not take we're real we're looking at the whole picture, but we're not taking in the whole picture. At times, you know, we we don't we focus in on pixels in, or not. Right. Now, in the story of Elijah, First Kings nineteen eight. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Here is Elijah fleeing the word of a woman. He is leaving Israel <clears throat> and he is going to Horeb where the law was proclaimed. Now we have Ezekiel 4, verses 5 and 6 before us. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days, so thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. But when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So here again, we have been looking at these verses that deal with day for a year. Jonah 3, 3, and 3, 4. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So we can definitely see a connection between the three and the forty. Right. We have three persons of the Godhead. We have three days. We have 40 days. All of these have had symbolic, prophetic, and literal reasons within the bible yes i agree matthew 4 1 and 2 mark 1 and luke 4 all three speak of christ's temptation then was Jesus lifted up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. 
and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. But when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Interesting that we don't just have two witnesses, but we have three. So was it unexpected? <laughs> well, I mean, this, how many, has a sense of humor for sure. Of course. <laughs> okay. But in, in this situation, here we have Christ fasting without food or water 40 days. But he was clinging to every word of God, which is, um, that is the bread. That, that's, that's why he didn't hunger. Don't you think? I would agree. But so we're, is, to be, we're to be that example, or we're to live up to that example? Well, we need to live up to that example, because what Christ did is to show that even in the weakness of humanity, he was able to hold on to the word of God. He was able to obey the word of God and not give in to the temptations of the adversary. Yeah, I agree. It definitely shows it. And the last verse dealing with 40 days. As an example from the book of Acts, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The question that we have that is before us and has been before us as we've been going through these studies is are we willing to accept the covenant that God is offering? Are we willing to search the scriptures diligently? Are we willing to take God just as he offers so that we can enter into this covenant and be prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Our, our demeanor should be um, uh, in fear and trembling during that time. I mean, and the only thing we're, if we're not fearing and trembling, then we definitely aren't accepting God. <laughs> okay. You know, be, my point is, is that, you know, we should be very, very much um, questioning our, our motives all the time. I mean, why you do things, you know, um, the, the motivation that you do, the, uh, I, I, is it out of, you know, uh, a habit? Um, or are you actually talking? Because she said that every moment, every breath needs to be a prayer. <laughs> right. <laughs> you need to be you need to be thinking about God the whole time that you're that you're breathing and, and speaking, especially. Yeah, because words can't be brought back into the mouth, you know. <laughs> I, I can't explain other than that's the way I felt about it. Okay. Can we do it? I, I, we should be able to do this, but there, you know, apprehension. We have to have apprehension about, not have to, but we have apprehension. It's just built in. Until we start to full trust, but that's what this whole endeavor is about, because isn't it the word that changes you? <laughs> Taking it into your heart, as bringing it as into your mind and into practice. As long as we are willing to take it into our heart, as That's long right. as we are willing to bring it into our practice, yeah. 
That's right. As long as we are willing to eat of his word and make it our own. That's right. Then are we not being prepared? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I mean, I'm just, you know, the reason I say these things, because it's not just us that's that we're talking about. We're talking about others that are that are going to be watching these videos and um, coming into this movement because, you know, uh, well, by the way, the number is 11 again, uh, or was 11 on the participants. I just seen a 12th one come in. So that's our average normally. Is there something to that? Or am, or am I being uh, that word that uh, he used earlier, mystical? <laughs> I, I I don't think so, but no, you know, I'm he, not. I'm jobble. <laughs> okay, we've covered quite a bit, and the reason behind this is to show that there is a good bit to address when we are looking to truly follow what is laid out in the writings that Father Miller had left for us and the mm. rules that he left. Now, Theodore's right. We're going to have to look at the third day. Time today is not going to permit that. Mm. Now, do we have any other thoughts or comments? Any other suggestions for what we should be next considering? Because there are still some pages left on this paper, but there are some other items that we could take up. The whole point has been to look, to bring these different verses together so that we can see the breadth of what has already been presented in Scripture. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to look at this breadth, if we're willing to look and consider these, these verses and compare them, we should be able to come to a conclusion. Agree. Okay. All right. Any other comments now? Okay, shall we close with prayer? Father in heaven, we do not see everything clearly. We need your guidance. We need you to open our eyes so that we may come to a better understanding of all that you would have us to know. Be with us through this Sabbath in the meetings that are yet to take place. We pray for your blessing. We pray for your watch care. We thank you for those that will be presenting. We look forward to Stephen's presentation later today. We ask, Father, that you help us to be prepared so that we may learn, we may take in, we may eat, and have these things to become part of us. Direct us in the path that you would have us to walk. Be with us so that we may be prepared for that rain that you would send, that we may recognize it, we may accept it, and be ready for all that you would have us to do. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.